Good morning, church. Please stand with us as we sing to our Lord. Welcome online. It's awesome to have you with us again. Sing with us as we praise God together. Display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sins You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true joy you're the reason that i sing you are life you are life in you death has lost its sting and though i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be in love Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here. Your presence I made whole. You are God, you are God. Of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be.
so much heavenly father but you are so good you are so gracious you are so loving and you are so faithful to us from now to our eternity with you and so much so that you give us the gift of our savior jesus christ and when we embrace this gift when we take him to heart and we choose to live a life with our savior you promise your goodness for all of our days might not be easy but it is good and you are faithful and you are true as much as the sun shines today, God. You give us this gift of praise and worship and to hear your message today and how faithful you are. We love you. We love you. We lift this message. We lift this worship. We lift this time as an offering to you. And we lift it all up in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. to remember to turn on my microphone. I'm taking a cue from Everett earlier. <laughs> I thought they did. Sometimes when you push it, you think, oh, we're good. You ain't good. That's what I did, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're all here this morning. We'd love to know that you're here. Uh, there's a little black book somewhere on that row. If you'll just fill that out, we would appreciate it. If you're watching online, we would love to know that you're out there watching also. So if you could just say hi to us, we would appreciate it. We'd love to know that you're out there watching because you are part of us. And we want you to know that and we want to know you're out there. Also, we are a church of prayer. In the back of the chair in front of you, there is a prayer card. If you've got something that's heavy on your heart this morning, someone, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's something that you want to praise God for or he's answered a prayer, fill out that prayer card and just drop it in the back in that silver box. And then if you're watching online, we would love to have your prayer request too and lift you up in prayer this week. So just email us at uh, email at scottsdalecc.com with your prayer request, or you can just click on the little contact us button there on our webpage or Facebook, and we will, you can send your prayer request in there too. And then join us on Wednesday night at six o'clock. We have our midweek prayer service every week. Uh, we meet right here in this room at six o'clock, pray over each and every one of these um, prayer requests that we get this morning through email through the web and it just amazes me to watch god work uh we've seen <laughs> some really great things happen uh through our prayer uh we know it's all god but it's serious fun to watch him work mm -hmm. on the things that we're watching and asking him for so come join and be part of that it's a great service it's not just prayer we're not going to make you pray we have Bible, uh, we have some Bible studying in there, or uh, readings in there. We talk. It's just a fun, great time, and we really enjoy having the Spirit work on Wednesday nights. So join us. Also, we got some things coming up. Uh, we do have our water drive going on. It's getting close to summer. So we need you to, as you see water on sale, grab us a case or two, and we'll start stocking that up for this summer, because that is going to be kicking in pretty soon. We'll be hot before we know it. Yay! <laughs> we'll change the subject on that one. Easter's coming up. Yay! <laughs> we are going to be having two services because if everybody's here, and which everybody will be on Easter, uh, our room might not hold everybody. So we are going to be doing our regular 930 service and then we're going to be doing one at 11 also. So make your plans to attend one of those two services. Uh, bring in great time to invite friends and family. People are more apt to come when you invite them on Easter than they are any other time of the year, even at Christmas. Easter is a bigger uh, invite time than even Christmas. So think about who you want to invite. Also during Holy Week on that Wednesday, we'll be having a midweek service, which we coordinate with our prayer service, and we'll be having Holy Week communion. So if you want to join us on Wednesday night for that, it'll be a different type of Wednesday night service. We'll be doing some praying for sure. But we'll also be including communion and thinking about the Last Supper and Jesus getting ready to go to the cross for us. So come join us that night also. Check your bulletins for all the other Bible studies. Thursday Connect is here this week playing games. 
uh, special events, outreaches, all those of you can find that stuff in your bulletin. At this time, we would like to take up our offering. So if you're here in the building, there's a little envelope in the back of the chair in front of you. You can just drop it in there and then drop it into the silver box back here in the back of the room. Or you can go online and give. Um, at our webpage, you can zell it, PayPal it, mail it, bank it, tom it. There's five ways. <laughs> if you're watching online, those same ways work for you also. We appreciate your continued support of this ministry called Scottsdale Christian Church. And so we just want to ask God to bless this offering and those who are providing it. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come to you today. To worship you in a way that shows that we really realize where everything comes from. That it comes from you. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to support this ministry that you've called us all to be a part of. We thank you for those that continue to give and support it. Because without those people, this ministry wouldn't exist. Father God, we ask that you bless this offering. Give us wisdom and guidance on how to use it. Put your plans on our hearts so that we will follow them and give us the courage to step out and do it. Father God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. We've reached the time in our service where we take up communion. So for those of you in the building, you should have received some emblems, some bread and some juice. And for those of you at home, you can uh, make do with what you have. Uh, for me, one of the most, I guess, haunting verses of the Gospels is in Luke chapter 9, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's foretelling that he's going to die. He's telling them about what's going to happen to him, how he's going to be betrayed. And at the end of saying that, he says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And to me, that hits hard because it's saying that our lives are just bigger than what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. All of us are a part of this story, no matter how big or small we are. And this is hard to fully live out because we live in a society that says it's all about you. It's all about your personal, individual identity, and that all of us are the main character. And why we take communion is to recenter ourselves and realize that while we are important and our lives are blessings, we should use those blessings not only for ourselves but for others. And that we should look to God and say, this is what you've given me, how can I give it back? And so this is why we take communion. This is why we bear our cross, because God has already come down and borne it, borne it for us. So let's take the bread that was broken for us. And the, the blood that was poured out for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all the gifts that you've given us, all the blessings that you provide in our lives, both big and small. I pray that this week you give us the gift of gratitude, help us to see things for what we have and not only look at it for how it affects us, but how it affects others. Help us to live our lives through that act, eyes of service and of love. I pray they be with everyone this Sunday, be with Tom and the worship team and everyone that this service goes smoothly and that you speak into our hearts, God. For it's in your name that we pray, amen.
stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death, he has conquered, now has ascended, my Lord evermore. not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again.
Wow. Wow. Well, today, and it was, wasn't it? <laughs> well, today we're going to finish up our series on the letters of Paul. The ones that he wrote to the individual churches, anyway. Today we're going to be looking at 2 Thessalonians. That song that we just sang, Glorious Days, that's one of my favorites. Something you may not know, though, is it comes from an old hymn that was written in 1908. Because I know these things. I grew up in a church with old hymnals. It, the name of it was One Day. Now the words are the same as they were in that old hymn. It was one of my grandmother's favorites. And I remember hearing her sing this song while she was cooking and cleaning, when she thought nobody was listening, she would always sing hymns. And this was one of the ones I would hear her singing quite often when I'd visit. Now this version that Cash and Crown does, even though the words are the same, they've changed the music a little bit, made it more of a little bit of a contemporary version. But the old hymn standard is still there. And what do I mean by that? Well, the old hymn standard used to be they would tell the gospel. A lot of these hymns are straight biblical verses. But their main goal was to tell the gospel. And to give you a feeling of it coming to life. And this song tells the gospel. From the very beginning to the end. And that fits into 2 Thessalonians really good today. Because this song pretty much outlaw, outlines Paul's message that's in this letter. Jesus, Son of God, came as a baby, born of a virgin, lived among men, as a man. Then one day he was led to the cross to die for us, for our sins. They buried him. He rose on the third day, and he's coming back on that glorious day. That's the gospel. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day he's coming. That's the complete gospel. Okay, there you go. We can all go home now. <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> It's getting close, though. I got gotcha. you. It's on a Saturday. <laughs> so this is the last Sunday before April Fool's. So what was Paul's purpose for writing this letter? In many ways, it echoes the message that he had in the first letter. He's sort of reinforcing what he had already told them. What he had already written to them. What he had already experienced and wanted them to know, at least in part. But he goes a little deeper on a couple of the issues here. It appears that there was some growing outward pressure on the Thessalonians and their church. So Paul writes to them to encourage them as he normally does. But he also encourages them on certain types of situations. He wants them to understand things a little differently or to put a little bit more focus on it. However, this time the encouragement that he gives them is focused on not being misled into a false understanding of who God is and what he, how, it, how suffering plays into it. How the suffering that many of us experience every day, how does God play into that? Why does he allow it? And, talk, and then they talk about our future suffering. The future suffering being those that happen in the end times. That scary time that we all hear about and read about in the book of Revelation. He wants them to understand how to navigate through hard times. Suffering, even when the worst of the world, that what the worst of the world can offer is affecting us. And when it starts to happen, when those days of tribulation 
begin to happen. He gives them one easy way to deal with any and all suffering, whether it's our own personal suffering or the suffering that is going to come to this planet. That advice or that easy way, two words, remain faithful. He wants them to understand that God is faithful. He wants them to understand that Jesus is faithful. And what, what and who they are never changes. They've always been and they always, always will be. And they will tell us something. When they tell us something, it's truthful. So whatever we see and we read and hear Jesus' words, it's the truth. And we should believe it and we should put our faith in that. We should be confident in that. So Paul reminds that church and us to remain faithful, remain hopeful, remain steadfast in our beliefs regardless of what we're going through. Then he makes a few points where and how to remain faithful in our lives. So we're going to look at those this morning. The first place he tells them to be faithful or to remain faithful is in their knowledge of Jesus. He wants them to understand that they should, the things that they already know, the things that he's taught them about Jesus, the things that they're continuing to learn about Jesus, about God, they should already be ready. Use that knowledge. Live in that knowledge. Look at verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 5. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? These things about who Jesus was, who Jesus is, who Jesus will be. He's talking about when he taught them about his teachings, Jesus' teachings, what they were, the example that he set for us to live by. He reminds them that they were taught that Jesus is the Son of God, sent by God, and died for our sins. He reminds them that they've been taught the gospel. He reminds them to keep, remain faithful in that knowledge that they have of Jesus, of the gospel. From the very beginning to the very end, from his birth to his return, through his life, through his burial, through his resurrection, everything about him until that return on that glorious day. Keep faithful in that knowledge. He's encouraged them to remember these things. He's encouraging them to be aware, to be on the lookout, to remember what they have heard, what they have been taught, and to be aware of what they see and whether it lines up with what they know to be true. So as we go through life and people are trying to tell you this or that or what's the gospel or what a Christian looks like, does it line up with this? That's important. It's important for us to know this, for us to be able to explore it and to, to gauge it to this. We need to stay in true to what we know. When we do that, we experience the glory of Jesus. Because we know we can't be fooled. No. Satan is a great deceiver. He's a great liar. He'll try to convince you of something that's not true. But if you know truth, you can see falseness. Look at verses, or chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He's reminding them again. He called you, Jesus called you to, to this through our gospel. Through what we have taught you. That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then brothers and sisters. Stand firm on what you know. Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we have passed on to you. Whether by word of mouth or by letter or by this book. Same goes for us. If we know Jesus and we remember our eternal future is with him. That's last week's message, if you remember. And then whatever we are going through in this temporary life is bearable. It may not be easy, but it's bearable. 
It might be hard. It might be rough. It might be sad. But when we compare it to our future, it's bearable. We can get through it. For non-Christians, this is hard for them to understand. Doesn't make sense to them. The world was telling them it didn't make sense to this church. How can you believe this? How can you be joyful in these times? Look around you. What's happening? But their focus needed to be on their future. And when our fo focus is on our future, we can get through these things. It doesn't make sense to other people. But when you have God in your life, when you let the Holy Spirit lead you, even comfort you, it is bearable because our eyes are fixed on something bit greater. Not our troubles, not our hardships, but something greater, something better. Paul's advice is to remain faithful in those times. Remain faithful in your knowledge of Jesus and what that means. Next he talks about remain faithful because Jesus is coming back. He spends a great deal of time. The whole basic chapter, chapter 2 is about Jesus' return. It's interesting to me that even in the New Testament times, people thought they were living in the end times. When you read some of these accounts later in the New Testament, they're looking for Jesus to return soon. They're comparing all the stuff that's going on around them and saying, it's bad. It's time for Jesus to come back. Mm -hmm. All this bad stuff that was happening then was proof of it to them. And it has remained that case for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, we've been looking for, waiting for Jesus to return. Now, his timing is perfect timing. I think it's God's way of making sure that each generation is prepared. If we don't know when he's coming and we can think it's going to be soon, we have a little bit of urgency in ourselves. I need to get right with Jesus because he might come over that, over that cloud tomorrow. So he keeps each generation with an urgency so that they can be ready at all times. And each of us have should have that urgency, whether we're living in Paul's time or today, that we need to be ready when the time comes. Our time, whether it's upon our death, which could happen to any of us at any time, or true end times, or if it is the big end times when Jesus returns. We need to be ready. End times is something we really need to think about. To understand, at least at some level. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to study it. Don't try to make it something even bigger than it is. We just need to be knowledgeable of it. Like all other aspects of Jesus. We need to be aware of what it's going to feel like. What it's going to look like. And that he will return. Paul reminds them in the midst of all this suffering. And their fears. That whether it's an end time suffering or everyday sufferings, the ultimate victory is in Jesus. And yes, he is coming back. He is coming back for us. Paul wants him, them and us to remain faithful in that knowledge. That's the most glorious thing for us. One day, the lawless one, Satan... Antichrist, the one behind all the chaos in this world, will be revealed. If you look at chapter 2, he gives us a big picture view of end times. Doesn't go into all the details and the symbolisms like Revelation does, but it's a great big picture view. For those of you in our Revelation class that follows this service, this is a good chapter for you to read. It's a good chapter for all of us to read, even if you're not in that, in that Bible study. Knowledge of Jesus and our future gives us peace. We all need peace, right? How many of you could use a little more peace in our lives? 
Big picture here. Satan, the lawless one, will be revealed. This is what this chapter is about. But that is not the end of the story. Paul wants them to realize that Satan doesn't win. That's not the end of the story. He may get some control. He may have some control. But it is not enough that people see who is really behind this evil. Once he's revealed, everybody's going to know who he is and what he's capable of. And the cruelty. He'll no longer hide behind his disguises. Everyone will know who is really behind the evil and the suffering of this world. But that's not the end of the story. It says Jesus will slay him merely with his breath. Wow, that's some power. Look at verse 8. You can find all this there. It says his very appearance will bring an end to all evil. The ultimate victory belongs to Jesus. We need to focus on that. Remain faithful. Because we are part of that victory that Jesus is going to have. We are part of that. That's our future. Whether you're in heaven when it happens, or whether we're here when it happens. But we must be ready in either case. We must have an urgency of our faith, our salvation, because we don't know when our end will come or the end will come. And if the madness of Re Re Revelation starts tomorrow, we can get through it because we know the outcome. We know how the story ends because he's already told us how it will end. We know who holds our future. And that is so comforting. We know Jesus wins. We know God wins. We know that the evil one loses. Amen. Paul wants the church to know that, to believe that, that if we must suffer here, if we focus on our future and not our suffering, we can survive it. It's bearable. Survive it until he takes us out of it. We may have a life complete with suffering. We see it in people. We see people that go through thing after thing after thing after thing. And we can feel for them. And we do feel for them. But when we compare it to an eternity of perfect, even a lifetime of suffering cannot compare. Whether it's individual suffering or the world suffering, end time suffering, whatever it is, Remain faithful. Remain faithful. And while we're doing that, we need to also remain faithful in our actions. Our own personal actions. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 4. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you were enduring. He's saying, look at you. You're doing it. You're handling it. Your actions should reflect your knowledge of Jesus. What you've been taught about Jesus. You should be living out the gospel. And he's seeing that in this church and he's commending them for it. He says, your lives should reflect your future in Jesus. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. For, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were, all, we were not idle when we were with you. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, to follow Jesus' example. You know what to do. You've been taught it. You see Jesus. You see the things he did. You know that's the things we're supposed to do. Paul reminds them that he has taught them the example of Jesus. What Jesus did. He showed them how to do those things, same things. Follow Jesus. Paul and the other believers were living that example out. Paul was living like Jesus. He was doing the best he could to be like Jesus. His future, he remembered and he lived in that knowing that his future was with Jesus. 
And he tells them that we should be sharing this with everyone that we know. Everyone that we can. Letting the world see Jesus in us. Even in hard times. I think especially in hard times. It's easy to be happy and easygoing Christian when everything is being given to us, right? And we're getting blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. Hey, I can live happily ever after in that, right? But when we start getting some of those roadblocks and those hurts and those pains and those trials, that's when people really look at us. What kind of example are we setting? Let people know we are faithful in what we have been taught and what we believe. Our actions show this time and time again. Our actions are important. So we need to remain faithful in our actions. And the way we live is the best testimony that we can give for our faith, especially in those hard times. It's our best tool to spread the gospel. Well, I'm not good at you know, spreading, sharing the gospel. Your life is a great way to do it. Live like Jesus, act like Jesus, you're sharing the gospel. Paul's big message in this letter is to remain faithful and find peace in any and all circumstances. That is such a powerful thing. Whatever we're going through, whatever our circumstances, find peace in it. As we look at the end, towards the end of the letter, as Paul draws the letter to a close, he asks for a special blessing upon them. And I think for us too. Verse 3, chapter 3, 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. Doesn't that make you feel good? Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times the hard times, the easy times, all times, and in every way. That was Paul's big finish to the Thessalonians. He prays for them to have peace in every circumstance. In the hard times, the easy times, end times. It's one thing to be aware of Jesus, to be aware of God, it's another to remember what has been said about God, about Jesus. But what's more important is what we've learned and what we've taken to heart and what we are living out. When we take what we know and what we've heard and we put it into action, when we do that, we get to experience this peace of God. That only through Jesus can we achieve. And no matter what the circumstances, the situation. This was Paul's prayer for them. That they would know God's peace. Not just in every situation and in every single way. But in every aspect of their lives. Suffering was not because of God punishing them. When we go through hard times or rough stuff, it's not God punishing us. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where Satan makes things happen. When we live in a world where other people's sin affects us. Sometimes it's just circumstances that, are, that we're in. It's not God's punishment. And he wants them to understand that. He wants them to realize that. It's important. The God of peace was with them and he's with us. So we need to remain faithful in that knowledge, in that truth. Now as we watch any news and as you hear people talking, end times is a hot topic today. If you watch the news or if you listen to other Christians, big and small preachers, end times is talked about with a real urgency today. If you Google, is the world ending? You should do that. Yeah. It's interesting. You will get all kinds of results down that rabbit hole. 
but you'll also see that it's referencing all kinds of current events. And it's matching them up with scriptures. It's taking and making them fit. They've been doing that since Paul's time. Does it make it right? Eventually, somebody's going to be right, right? <coughs> but Google it, and you'll see all kinds of stuff. It's amazing what is happening in our world. It's also amazing what we now know is happening in our world. We live in a time where everything is known. So we know a lot more stuff. So we can find a lot more examples now because we have the internet. People matching them up with verses from Revelation. You'll see the same verse lined up with 27,000 different events. This is the event this guy, no, this is the event this guy said. This is proof. No, this is proof. Somebody might be right. Might be. You can't deal in that and live in that, that fear though. We know who has control of the end. We know who has control of our future. And it will eventually, it will eventually happen. And I can guarantee you that today, we are one day closer than we were yesterday. That's about the best promise I can make you or the best prediction I can make. We very well be, may be living in those final days. But does that mean that we are, should change the way we think or change the way we live? Not if we're living for Jesus. It should be the same. The same urgency. The same need. The same focus. The world may end next week. It may end next year. It may end at some point a thousand years from now. God's timing is totally different. A day is a thousand years to him. But it's God's way. It's God's way of keeping our attention. When we see all this stuff around us, we should focus on it. We should look for things to help, places to help, places to, to show God, and places to unveil where Satan is working. That's okay for us to do. This is a crazy time that we live in. People have believed that the world was ending ever since Paul wrote this letter. Eventually, someone will be right. Now, without downplaying the seriousness of this issue, of the issues that are happening around us, the scary stuff that is happening around us, not downplaying any of that, but the belief that the world is coming to an end is nothing new. When you look at Paul's time, when he wrote these letters to the churches, and you start comparing it to us today, there's a lot of similarities. The world around them, the governments were making biblical things unlawful or lawful, changing laws to fit their, their, their outbreaks and their, their, their needs and their desires. Not downplaying any of this, but falling into the thinking that what can lead to a better us? What can lead us to making better judgments, making better choices? We don't want to let these things happening around us make our judgments bad on how we live our lives. Paul reminds us the things we need to keep in mind before the end arrives. Remain faithful in our knowledge of Jesus. Know Jesus. Remain faithful because Jesus is coming back. And we need to be ready. He reminds us to remain faithful in our actions on how we live our lives, how people see us living our lives. Remain faithful and live like Jesus. Remain faithful and find peace in any and all circumstances because our future is where? In Jesus, in God's hands. We may be in end times. What will end times be like? Is a question we get, especially when we start looking at the book of Revelation. I don't know exactly, but I do know what our future looks like. We will be in the presence of the great I am. God himself living our best life 
All this stuff that gets us down now will be gone. God himself will be at our side. Every hardship, every disease, every pain, every tear wiped away. It's going to be better than anything we could possibly imagine if we are ready. If we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on back up here now. Because I'm going to ask you guys a question. If we are ready, if we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have this future with God. If you have, I want you to stand up right now. And we're going to praise God. We're going to praise the great I Am. If you have not, I would love to have a conversation with you. I'd love to pray with you so that you too can be a part of this great celebration waiting on us on that glorious day. Today, my ending prayer is going to be our worship. It's going to be our worship as we sing to the one and only great I Am, God Almighty, King of Kings, before the power and the presence of the great I Am. That is our future. Remain faithful.
shake. Sing this with us. Here we go. The mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great. God, the great I am. We're here before you. We're worshiping you this morning. Father God, we thank you for being here with us. We feel your presence. Father God, we thank you for loving us so much that you have this bright future for us at your side. And what we just experienced in this moment will be what our life is like worshiping you our great father the great I am our father with Jesus our savior king of majesty Father God I pray that we have the courage and the strength to be good examples that we remain faithful and we go out into this world and we love each other we serve each other we take care of each other we cry with each other. We hold each other. We comfort each other. And we celebrate with each other. Father God, I ask that you just take all of our hurts today. All our struggles. And just wrap your loving arms around us and let us feel your comfort. Whatever it is we're going through. Father God, we love you. Jesus, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts this morning for what you did for us on that cross. Father God, be with us. Father God, be with each and every person in this room or is watching online. I pray that they find peace in all circumstances through you. And it's in your son's precious holy name this morning that we pray and say amen. And the church said have a great Sunday. Bible study starts in 10 minutes.